Our church supports a ministry called Project Hana or Projeto Ana in Portuguese, which is under the umbrella of Transworld Radio Brazil. This week, Transworld Radio's international board met here in Sao Paulo, and we have some of the board members and their spouses here. Uh, please stand up so that we can see who you are. Yes, Werner, you too. Yes, you're a member. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and we have the privilege, thank you, you may be seated, we have the privilege of having Tom Lowell with us here today. He has been with Transworld Radio for several years in different uh, positions, different capacities, working in Bonaire, Guam, and in the headquarters in North Carolina. He is currently the chairman of the International Board, and he is going to bring God's word, God's message to us today. God bless you and use you. Good morning. I'm not a stranger to Brazil or to Sao Paulo. Um, back in the 70s when we were beginning the work here, I made rather frequent trips to Sao Paulo to be with Reverend Edmund Speaker who was our first director. I stayed with his family. At that time, he had three little children. And um, it was a way for me to get indoctrinated into some of the culture and the language of Brazil. In their house, they spoke both German, because Edmund had a German background, and Marli was Brazilian, so there was Portuguese. And these little children spoke both languages. I did not. That's one of the unfortunate things of the frequent trips to Brazil over the years that I did not learn the language. But their little daughter, who was probably four or five at the time, called me her Chinese uncle. And the reason that I was Chinese was because that I un did not understand either the German or the Portuguese. It's good to be back in Brazil after all of these years and our board, which is an international board, has enjoyed our time with staff here, with seeing some of the country and with spending a good number of hours discussing the business. One of the things that I think was encouraging to me was to interact with the staff, RTMB staff, and I'm always encouraged to see young people, uh, a, a new and a younger generation, uh, assume the responsibility of ministry. And it was a joy to be with them. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and I pray that the Lord will direct our thoughts as we look to the scriptures, and uh, that the Lord will enable me, through his Holy Spirit, to speak uh, the words that I feel God has placed on my heart. I've chosen the title of my thoughts today from John's Gospel, chapter 11, and verse 35. Two words. Jesus wept. Some years ago, when we lived on the island of Bonaire with TWR, our children attended the only schools that were available, and they were Dutch schools. And so coming from the United States, there was a transition both culturally and uh, language-wise for the kids to learn Dutch. They were young at the time. Uh, the two oldest were, I think, in first and second grade. However, they had to go back to the first grade. Uh, and my oldest son was very upset that having been through the first and the second grade in the States, he had to go back to the first grade but the reason was to learn the Dutch language. They were young, and uh, the Dutch language came. Homeschooling was not an option. 
And young people, if you can believe this, it was the day before the internet. This was 1965. So the only option for them was to attend the Dutch schools. On one occasion, a gentleman from TWR who lived in the States brought a group to visit the island. And we had a meeting with them. And they wanted to interview my daughter to find out how she was adjusting culturally and how she was doing with the language. So he asked her a few questions about Bonaire, about the people of the island, and then he asked her to say something in Dutch. And he was expecting, I'm sure, a long sentence, but she said, Jesus heled, which is Dutch for Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. Although the verse is brief, it's powerful, and it's filled with natural human emotion, and it comes from the God-man, Christ Jesus. I've thought a lot about the two natures that resided in the Lord Jesus. He was fully God, and he was fully man. Think of that for a moment. This has never happened before, and it's never happened since. A person living here among us as man, and yet he was God. This is an awesome event and an awesome thought that we can't fully appreciate or understand, but by faith we accept it and thank God because his son understands the Father and his son understands us and that we're made up of human frailty. In the book of Luke, we read of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. This is in Luke chapter 19. It takes place on his donkey ride on Passover into the city of Jerusalem. Passover is what we uh, today call Palm Sunday. And he stopped and he looked over the city and he wept. He had heard the crowds praise his name, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he had heard the rebuke of the Pharisees who asked him to tell his disciples to be quiet. And his response was, If they are quiet, these stones will cry out. Jesus had warned of a day coming when enemies would encircle the city the scriptures say they will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls and not one stone will be left on another because they did not recognize the time of God's coming to them in the person of Jesus Christ. About 40 years after Jesus said these words, the prediction came true. In 70 AD or in 66 AD, the Jews rebelled against the Roman rule and in 70 AD, the Romans came, broke down the walls of the city, entered it, burned it, killing some 600,000 Jews. Jesus saw the future picture of what was going to take place in Jerusalem, and he wept. Isaiah 53, 3 describes our Lord as despised, rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus prayed, his body actually oozed blood. His prayer was so fervent. I think his tears over Jerusalem came from a different sense of sadness than that of his friend Lazarus and his death. Let me read for you the account of the death and resurrection of Lazarus. This is in the 11th chapter of the book of Luke. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Martha, the Mary rather, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. 
But when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When therefore he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were now seeking to stone you, and you were going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. This he said after he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of his sleep. The disciples therefore said to him, Lord, if he's falling asleep, fallen asleep, he will recover or wake up. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. Then Jesus therefore said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas therefore, who is called Didymus, said to the fellow disciples, let's also go that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary sat still in the house. Martha therefore said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it you. And Jesus said to her, your brother shall live again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here, and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she arose quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but still was in a place where Martha met him. And the Jews who were there with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him and she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And so the Jews were saying, Behold how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man, who opened the eyes of him who was blind, and kept this man also, could, could have kept this man also from dying? Jesus, therefore, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I knew that you heard me always, you hear me always. But because of the people standing around, 
I said it, that they may believe that you did send me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He who died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many, therefore, of the Jews who had come to Mary and beheld what he had done believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus had done. Why did Jesus weep? He knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So I don't think he wept because Lazarus was dead. He had lost Lazarus, a friend, for a short time. He was a good friend. He was filled with sadness as he rubbed shoulders with Mary and Martha and friends. I think that he felt a great wrath against death. And he probably foresaw the damnation of the Jews who were present, who would witness the miracle, yet they would not believe in him. Instead, some would run to the Pharisees and tell them what had gone on. This shows our Lord as truly man, subject to like passions as we are, only without sin. In contrast to the wailing of the wake coming from the mourners who had gathered, we see the silence of the tears running down Jesus' cheeks. These tears have been for all ages, a grand testimony of the fullness of Jesus' humanity and also a divine revelation of the very heart of God. In Isaiah 25, we read, He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Hebrews 2 says, For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Philippians 2.8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Here we have a picture of the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb. The psalmist uses the word silah. Think about that. The lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb. My question to you today, and a question that I've asked myself in recent weeks, is does Jesus weep today? He's promised us that in heaven there will be no tears. He will wipe them away. And we look forward to that. It's hard for us to imagine living in the presence of God where there will be nothing to cause sorrow or discord. I wonder if God's heart is moved when he looks down on our world today, a world that he created, his earth, his creation. Does he shed tears when he looks down on the country of Brazil, the people of Sao Paulo, people that he created? those that he loves and sees our future. He knows our future, for there's a day of judgment that's coming upon us as a world, as a nation, and as a people. His creation will be tried by fire. 
Have you ever pictured in your mind what it may, might be like as you stand before the Lord Jesus and you look into his eyes and he gazes upon your eyes? What do you think it will be like? Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or will his eyes reflect disappointment in the way we've lived our lives? Does Jesus shed tears today as he sees people who are lost with no hope, headed for Christless eternity unless they hear and respond to God's loving call to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved? I don't know the answer to whether Jesus weeps today, but he certainly has to be moved seeing the events that unfold here on earth and how they impact our lives. All you have to do is look at TV or read the newspaper or the internet, and you have to wonder, how long, Lord, how long are you going to wait? I considered the emotions that the Lord Jesus went through as I looked through scriptures. He had compassion. He felt anger. He was consumed with zeal. He was troubled, greatly distressed, very sorrowful, depressed, deeply moved, grieved. He sighed. He wept. He sobbed. He groaned. He was in agony. He was surprised, amazed, rejoiced greatly, full of joy. He greatly desired, and he loved. Those are the emotions of our Lord as you look through Scripture. And those are our emotions. We need to gaze upon him and learn to experience the emotions of Jesus in a godly sense. Then we can know him, and in knowing him, we will know God, and we will know ourselves a little better as we were created. Second Corinthians 3.18 says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is a spirit. Jesus wept. The Holy Spirit lives in us today as believers. He, the Holy Spirit, is the silent partner of the Trinity. Where he goes, where we go, he goes. What we say, he hears. What we do, he sees. And what we think, he comprehends. Let me share my life verse with you. I chose it as a young man after reading a book by Watchman Nee. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He loves me today, and he loves us still. My greatest concern, I think, as I stand before the Lord Jesus is sadness, regret that I have not personally been a better witness to others. My wife has the gift of witnessing. Every time that she goes to the supermarket, she comes back with stories of people that she's ministered to. She's even prayed with women in the aisle of a supermarket. Folks, that's a gift. I don't have that gift. 
it's wonderful to be able to talk about the Lord among Christian friends. Easy to do. It's great to be able to talk about the Lord Jesus and salvation and the blessings that we know and experience as believers in church. Even to get up and to give a message. But what happens when I go out the door of the church? To the mission field, right outside the door. Not the foreign mission field, the local mission field. The Lord's desire is that all might hear the gospel, that all might come to repentance. How are they going to get there? <clears throat> they must hear, first of all, Romans 10 tells us, how can they hear without a preacher? And today, you and I are preachers. We are the vessels that God has chosen to carry his glorious message. I suspect that if Jesus weeps over the lost today, he rejoices over one sinner who repents and comes to faith in Christ, John 15, 10. Transworld Radio is an international ministry using all of the communications technology that is available to us today to speak hope into a hopeless world filled with hopeless people so that lasting fruit is produced. Our message goes out in some 230 languages and dialects to 160 countries around this world. One of the projects that's been exciting and you people in Brazil have been involved, <clears throat> TWR Brazil has been involved, is Women of Hope. It's a program that's designed to speak to the needs of women, to give them vital spiritual truth to address critical social issues and to offer practical help for daily living. <clears throat> Today, there are some 55 prayer groups in 125 countries around the world that are praying for this program that it might speak to the hearts of women. Somewhere around 70 languages this program has been produced in and one of them is Portuguese. This is just a glimpse of the burden we have to reach out with the gospel and to tell people about Jesus Christ. As you go into the week before us, my prayer is that God would help you to see the face of Jesus, to see the tears that were coming down his cheeks, maybe to taste those tears, the saltiness of the tears, and to realize that um, he came to die, to shed his blood so that we might have life life eternal. And I would pray that God would help us to radiate the love of Jesus so that when people look at our faces, when we interact with people in the workplace, with our children at home, they will sense there's a difference there. What's different? And that you will draw people to you and give you the opportunity to witness for Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for 
your word. We thank you, too, that you have not left us comfortless. You have given us your Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to convict us of sin, to reveal all righteousness to us, to help us live the new life that you have so freely given as we've trusted you. I thank you for these people, for this church, for their witness in this great city of some 11, 12 million people. Lord, uh, help us this week to put a smile on your face. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.